Please welcome the Vice Chair of Education for the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber, Teresa Rose Crook. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I know that these events, um, some of the, one of the great parts of these events is getting to see one another, getting to see your friends um, that are in other parts of the city, maybe work in other buildings, maybe even work in the same building that you do. But coming together today to talk about the state of our schools, the state of education in our city and in our state, um, but to know those people that you are otherwise associated with that also have a passion and an interest for public education, I always find very exciting. Um, I love this day every day, and I think today we've got some really great speakers that are going to give us some really interesting information and perspectives about how we as leaders, business people, maybe parents, can have a greater and more profound impact on the state of education, the children in our public education system, and ultimately the impact to our city. So good morning. Um, welcome to the annual State of the Schools event hosted by the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber. Now when you came in, I hope you noticed, there were some cameras so it's kind of hard uh, to not notice, the boxes of school supplies that were being gathered. Um, our friends at American Assurance Fidelity pulled that together for us and we very much appreciate their interest and their focus and support for public education. Those supplies that were donated along with the school supplies that are on your desk are going to be donated to the Boys and Girls Club and that will be distributed to the participants in those programs to help those children get off to a great start and have the basic supplies that they need that they might not otherwise have to have a successful school year. So this marks our 12th annual discussion about the importance of education in our community. Oklahoma schools, as I'm sure all of you know, all of us know, are facing more challenges than ever before. Oklahoma City's future is also dependent on these students. So at the same time that we have a system that is under tremendous pressure, we have tremendous need in the business sector for this system to succeed. Now the first thing that I'd like to do is express our appreciation to the more than 30 elected leaders that have joined us today from state and local government positions. Please, if you are an elected official, please stand and let us thank you for your commitment and contribution. Without people like you that are committed to giving up your family time, your personal time, even some of your business time um, to be of service to the greater community, uh, our city and our state wouldn't be near as successful as it is. I also want to thank and recognize our signature sponsor for today's event, Bank of Oklahoma. Help me join John Higginbotham, CEO of Bank of Oklahoma, to the stage for a few words. Thank you, Teresa. I am here to share an exciting announcement. Bank of Oklahoma recognizes the financial struggles that our inner city students have and the obstacles that they must overcome to get ahead. We want to make a real impact on these students. I am here to announce publicly that Bank of Oklahoma will give $30,000 in college scholarships to Oklahoma City School public school seniors. Six students will each be awarded $5,000 to cover their first year of college expenses and kickstart their ability to continue their education. Students may apply through the Oklahoma City Community Foundation beginning on October 1st, and the scholarships will be awarded next spring. Bank of Oklahoma's Achieve Your Goals scholarships are not targeting the straight-A students, but those that are well-rounded and have consistently shown and performed scholastically with the hope of continuing their education endeavors. Most importantly, we want students that have the drive to change their future. 
and hopefully stay in Oklahoma City and become role models for future generations. Bank of Oklahoma wants to challenge other companies to do the same, to step up and help shape the future of our inner city students. Superintendent Laura, we are behind you 100%. And through your leadership, we look forward to a great future with our kids. Thank you. Wow, thank you, John, and thank you, Bank of Oklahoma. What a tremendous way to get this luncheon started. Um, your commitment to our students, um, to the future of Oklahoma City is very evidenced. So we have a packed program today, and as I mentioned, a couple of really exciting and informative speakers for you. Today we'll be here for two people, um, both of whom are dedicated to improving the landscape of education nationwide and right here in Oklahoma. To introduce our first speaker, it is my pleasure to welcome Justin Ellis, Vice Chair for the Board of Oklahoma City Public Schools, who will introduce our first speaker. Justin? Thank you, Teresa, and thank you for the uh, Chamber for putting this wonderful luncheon together. I'll start by saying that being an Oklahoma City Superintendent today is like running for the United States President. The media reports about the negative. But Aurora and the Oklahoma City Public School staff are doing amazing things, and they are far from negative. Superintendent Aurora Laura took over Oklahoma City's largest school district at a time when we were trying to figure out how to cut $30 million from our budget due to critical financial issues facing the district. Superintendent Laura had to lead and make major changes to staffing and programs. A lot of people would have run from that, but Aurora, she dug in. She made the tough decisions. Some are calling her the people's superintendent because she makes it a point to get out into our schools and communities and listen. The focus is on the kids with Superintendent Laura, on how we can improve the education experience for our students. She's in the process of creating task force to gain community input to help understand underperforming schools. She's creative. She's creating communities for students, uh, committees for students, parents, teachers, and principals so she can listen to those who are on the front lines and use the information to make our schools better. We know that there will be even more difficult decisions to be made and I am confident that we have the right person to get us through them. Even though she's University of Texas alum, she's been committed and dedicated to Oklahoma City, where she has bought a new home. The accolades surrounding her career, her career accomplishments in urban schools are impressive. Aurora Laura is responsible for leading and overseeing Oklahoma City's public schools 46,000 students and 5,000 staff members with over 89 buildings. Miss Laura joined Oklahoma City Public Schools in 2014 and responsible for developing, implementing, supervising district-wide curriculum, working with human resources to train and evaluate the staff, and monitoring student achievement and school effectiveness. Prior to this, Laura served as assistant superintendent for Dallas Independent School District, executive director for PK through 12 schools for the Seattle Public School, and was a middle high school principal in Portland Public Schools. In 2000, she was a Teach for America Corps member. Laura taught fourth grade at Ryan Elementary School in Houston, Texas. She holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Texas at Austin and a master's degree in education policy management at Harvard University. We are fortunate to have her as a superintendent of Oklahoma City Public Schools. It is my honor, it is my privilege to welcome you 
Superintendent Aurora Lower. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so honored and happy to be standing before you today as the new superintendent of Oklahoma City Public Schools. And today I'm going to share with you some of the great work that's going on in our school district and also our plans for the next five years. But before I get started, I want to thank the members of our Board of Education who are with us this morning. Um, I'm going to um, in fact, if they can please stand, I would like everyone to see them. These people work tireless, tirelessly for our school district. Looks like we've got a couple here. We've got uh, board chair Lynn Harden, vice chair representing District 2, Justin Ellis. Representing District 1, we have Bob Hammock. District 3, we have Carrie Jacobs. District 4 is Paula Lewis. District 5 is Ruth Veals, District 6 is Gloria Torres, and District 7 is Ron Milliken. I also want to thank Roy Williams, Drew Dugan, and Teresa Rose Crook for your partnership as we work together to improve our schools and for having me here today to be able to share with people our vision for the Oklahoma schools. Also want to take a moment to thank the district leadership team. If we have any members of the district leadership team here today, could you all please stand? I think there's just a couple. But these are um, some amazing, hardworking employees. And when we had to cut uh, $30 million from our budget, I had to eliminate 30% of the senior leadership team at Oklahoma City Public Schools. And the people who are still here had to take over um, all the work from the three members that we lost. And so these people um, not only were working night and day before the budget, but now are working even harder with more duties and are spread so thin just to keep our schools afloat. And so I owe them a debt of gratitude. And finally, um, one other great partner in this work has been Mary Malone with the public schools in the P Oklahoma City Public Schools Foundation. Um, they have just been tremendous partners as we've had to think through how to cut $30 million from our budget and helping to fundraise for us to help us plug those, those holes. So I just want to thank all of them today for their work um, and support of the public schools. So you might have heard, some of you might have heard me speak before and probably know a little bit about my story, but I want to just share one piece of my background that I think explains why this work is so important to me. I, um, the reason I decided to go into public education actually stems back to my high school experience. I went to high school at a low-income school on the border to Mexico in El Paso, Texas. My high school was predominantly free and reduced lunch. It was 90% Hispanic. I myself am the daughter of an immigrant from Mexico. And I had done great all through school and made straight A's and everything, did everything my teachers had told me. So I thought when I got to college, it would be a breeze. I graduated valedictorian of a, of a high school of 2,500, um, had my choice of full rides, to several state universities, which is why I chose the University of Texas. And when I got to college, I was in for the biggest shock of my life. Um, I, I got into this specialized honors program at UT and had a seat in the, a space in the honors dorm and was in my first college honors English class. And I wrote my first essay for college and turned it in. I'd always been told I was a great writer, had had straight A's all through school. Um, I figured this paper was going to come back with like 100% and A plus and smiley faces. And instead, I got the shock of my life when our professors passed back our papers. And he was passing them out to each of the students in the class. And I was the last one that he gave a paper to. And he stopped <laughs> when he was passing them back. And he looked at me, and instead of handing me my paper, he said, this is the worst writing I've ever seen. Who taught you how to write like this? And he tore up my paper and threw it down onto the table. And I was mortified. Um, I had just graduated valedictorian, and I had done everything my teachers taught me in our 
standardized test remediation classes that were mandatory for all the kids at my El Paso High School. It was a five-paragraph essay that they teach you how to write to pass the state exams. It started with the introduction, then it had reason one, reason two, reason three, and then the conclusion. And that's exactly what I did because that's how I learned how to write in, in high school. And, um, and in that moment, I just, I didn't know what to do. I tried desperately not to cry in front of all my classmates. And I went back and I called my mom that night and I said, you know, I don't, I don't think I can do this. I'm so humiliated. I don't want to go back to that English class. And the truth is, I was struggling in science. Um, I was pre-med my first year and um, really, really struggled in basic chemistry and biology because I realized I was coming in without any of the background knowledge that all these other kids seem to have. And that's when I realized what a disservice my high school had done by not preparing me for success after graduation. It's not enough to get straight A's and 100% and to graduate valedictorian if they haven't actually prepared you with the rigor to go on to be successful with where you're going next. And so my story is a happy ending because I turned my situation around. Uh, my mom wouldn't let me drop out and go back to El Paso, so I <laughs> went to the writing center. I got tutoring, um, and it took me an extra year, but I graduated from undergrad five years later. And you do know the happy part of this story is that Later, I used this experience and was able to get into Harvard, so obviously I learned some lessons um, about writing. But the thing is, when I was a senior and graduating from college, it really struck me that very few people from my high school graduating class were, were graduating um, with a college degree because many of them who had left El Paso faced similar challenges and dropped out and went back. And I felt so angry that a system can do so little to prepare kids from low-income backgrounds to be successful in their futures. And I felt like I would have had a very different experience had I had a different high school, if I'd gone in a different zip code. And so many of the kids at my school would have had different experiences too. So I had this kind of anger building inside me, and that's why I decided I wanted to join Teach for America. Um, and that's a program that takes college graduates and recruits them to go teach for two years in low-income schools. And I got assigned to teach fourth grade in inner city Houston and went on and had this really um, amazing experience that changed my life because I was able to show that when teachers hold high expectations for kids and put high levels of support in place, they absolutely will rise to the level of expectation and do amazing, amazing things. And it was my two years of teaching that made me realize this is, to me is not a two-year commitment. This is a lifelong commitment that I have to helping support kids in low-income communities. And that's what started my journey um, and led me here today to becoming superintendent. So um, that's a little bit about me. I do want to share with you some of the great things going on in our district right, um, right now because it has been a challenging year for us with the budget and changing superintendents, but we've got a lot to be proud of. So one, um, this past year, we administered more advanced placement exams in 2016, almost 500 more. It's a 25% increase in the number of kids taking AP tests, which means more kids in our, in our district are taking advantage of academically rigorous courses. We also had 31 students this year qualify as Oklahoma academic scholars um, to get this qualification, kids have to have a minimum of a 3.7 GPA or be in the top 10% of their college, I mean, of their high school class. They have to complete all requirements for a high school diploma and receive at least a 27 on the ACT or a 1220 combined on the SAT. And so even more of our students are being prepared, being successful. Uh, we'd like to see this number, of course, go higher, but we definitely feel this is a good sign that we're heading in the right direction. Uh, we got selected to pilot a pretty innovative new model of personalized learning. And this is actually a model that is out on the West Coast. And Facebook got behind it to sponsor um, full training for teams from three of our schools, Arthur, Scheidler, not Arthur, uh, Adams, Scheidler, and Jackson Elementary, where we're training sixth graders in um, a personalized learning model using technology, and we think this is gonna change the face of public education. I won't get into all the details here, but this is pi piloted in three places. Um, Tulsa is also piloting this, and we want to take this um, much broader if we start to see success, but we're really excited about this, and um, we'll look forward to showcasing that later on this year. 
We've also, you've probably heard a lot about discipline in our district. Uh, we did have fewer suspensions this year. Uh, 500 fewer students were suspended. And in the grand scheme of things, we had 5,000 fewer school days missed due to suspensions last year. So we're trying new strategies and doing our best to keep kids in school so we can keep them focused on learning. 13 years of clean financial audits that we're really proud of. And also, um, we opened school this year with our lowest number of vacancies. We currently have 37 vacancies in the district, which um, if you know about our experience in the past, there have been years where we've opened with 150 vacancies. Last year, it was probably close to 100. So to be down to 37 is a really, really great accomplishment because that means more teachers, more kids are getting access to a full-time teacher for their classroom. Um, although I will not be happy until we get this number to zero, which hopefully will be um, next year if we can make some changes to make it easier to attract teachers to Oklahoma. And the last thing is I want to share um, just a quick story about some of the amazing students that we have in Oklahoma City. And this is a story about one of our students last year um, that really touched my heart. And I want you to see the types of students that we are working with in our district. We're here at U.S. Grant High School today to deliver the first admissions packet for the class of 2020. Gregoria is the first student uh, to be admitted this year at the University of Oklahoma, and we are ecstatic that she comes from uh, U.S. Grant High School. For years, U.S. Grant was known as a dropout factory, a very low-performing school. Over the last several years, we've gone through a tremendous transformation uh, to the point where we are now just one point away from being an A school, and Gregoria is a shining example of that type of performance. She comes from a large family. She's not a typical kid or a typical teenager. My parents have taught me always to keep striving for what you want to become because when they came from Mexico, they had to, they had to go through a lot of things just to get me to where I am today. And so it's basically like paying them back, showing them that I'm a success. Here in the United States, there are more opportunities. Where we lived in Mexico, public school only goes through the sixth grade. Here, she can do anything, and we are so proud of her, and we just want to support her in all that she does. Goya hasn't told anybody that she's even applied. I didn't tell many people at all. I would hate to disappoint my parents. There's the number one reason. And then it'd be to disappoint myself from how hard I've worked to just go and like fail and be like, no, you can't do it. OU is a big deal for her and I think for her family. The day before the application came out, I was just staring at the countdown clock the whole time, just waiting for it. And the last second, that's when I started to apply. The second it came out. Well, you is the only application I sent in. Today is a great day to be a senior at the U.S. Grant High School. First when they announced that OU was there, I was like, okay, what are they gonna do? Try to, like, try to get students to apply. I thought it was just another one of those. And I was like, why are all these cameras here? And then they said my name and it was just like, it was overwhelming. It was just like, like those moments where you think it's like surreal, like it couldn't be happening. Like I'm dreaming, I'm about to wake up, but no, it's all real. It was just like amazing because everyone was trying to get pictures and interviews and like my mom's like, come take a picture. And like my friends are like, Goya, Goya, come here, come take a picture with me. And then they just like all surround me. It's amazing. Like I'm trying to hold it together and they're like expressing all the emotions I wanted to express. Um, we were so excited, I thought I was going to fall. My arms and legs were shaking. I felt like I was the one getting accepted. I was so happy and I felt so proud to have so many people supporting us, to have so many people supporting her. It's a big step for her, a very big step. And I just want to say to all of the parents out there that sometimes our salary isn't enough to pay for our kids to go to college. But if we put all of our support into our children and their studies, they're going to find a way to go to college. And so for me, paying college would be difficult, right? And because I have younger siblings too that my parents have to take care of, so it's kind of like all on me. So we. We've actually got one more letter for you to open up. If you want to take a look at it, it's your estimated financial package. Yeah? Really? Really? She just, really? She just, she just got a full ride. 
Thank you. Thank you. Like, it's, it's crazy. Like, like I said, it would be hard to do it, but like, no, it's like, I'm unstoppable. I'm gonna say, um, so I was there at that ceremony where she found out she had been accepted and her family was there and she found out she got a full ride to college and uh, it was one of the most moving experiences of my life just to see that and to witness the joy and to see the pride in the eyes of her mom and dad um, and to know like this is why this work is so important for us in Oklahoma City Schools and I'm just gonna say, even as a Texas Longhorn, I was cheering for OU by the end and <laughs> crying. And I did buy an OU shirt, but don't tell anyone from Texas. <laughs> so those are the great things that are happening. But then our budget crisis hit. And um, as many of you know, it was my first month on the job um, where suddenly um, I'm stepping in as superintendent and I'm forced to immediately cut $30 million from our budget. And there is no easy way to do that when you're already one of the lowest funded states in the nation. And so this forced me to have to make really difficult decisions right from day one on the job. We had to cut 208 teaching positions. We laid off 100 people from central office, including 30% uh, of senior leadership. We cut 100 people from operations, and you're hearing about our operations challenges right now when you hear these air conditioner stories and things. We have a skeleton crew. We're working as fast as we can, but it is very difficult um, to run 90 schools and get everything up and running when you've had to make such devastating and deep cuts. We also had to cancel our textbook purchases this year, slash school budgets so they can't even buy the supplies that they used to have. We postponed maintenance projects, canceled athletic uniform orders. The list just goes on and on. This is a really, really difficult time um, to be an educator in the state of Oklahoma. But we're not letting that stop us from our mission of providing a world-class education to the kids of Oklahoma. Starting two years ago, we gathered uh, more than 150 teachers and school leaders, parents, community members, business leaders together um, to identify what our goals were for the next five years in Oklahoma City. And so even though we've had a change in superintendents, even though we've had a budget crisis, our commitment to the goals that I'm about to share with you has been unwavering, and we are about to double down and make sure that kids are improving and getting access to a great education in Oklahoma by focusing on these seven areas um, that were set by that committee two years ago. And so I'm going to start just briefly by going through um, what the big seven areas are that we're working on in Oklahoma City and some ways that we are um, implementing some strategies to try and get to these goals. Number one is we want to make sure that every student will meet literacy and numeracy readiness criteria um, for a successful transition from pre-K to second. Because if we do a great job with educating our kids early, then they're not going to end up having reading gaps by the time they get to third grade. So one of the ways that we're doing this is by um, putting leveled book rooms in place. And if you see in the picture, this is what um, our leveled book rooms look like. What we've got there is we've put at every school um, sets of materials um, that are grouped by letters. So from level A all the way up to level Z. And we're training teachers how to teach literacy, not by teaching one story to the full class, but by grouping kids in the actual area level reading that they're at so that they're maximizing their instructional time in the classroom. And so they pull the different boxes um, to get the materials for the different groups that they run. It's just a smarter way to teach reading, and so we're, we've invested in that this year. We also just want to thank uh, many of our early childhood partners who are working with us to uh, get to these goals around early literacy and numeracy um, in as much as invested so much to help us get pre-K for all kids, which I'm going to say that's one of the reasons why I wanted to come to Oklahoma. This is something that every urban district dreams about having, and this is um, just such an amazing gift to have pre-K for all children in this city. Um, so I want to thank them for helping us to get that off the ground. 
Um, they also run a really great educator, uh, educare center, which is a tat or right next door to Cesar Chavez Elementary. Um, Smart Start, which is helping to train our families in how to work with their kids at home, especially um, with their very, very young babies. Um, and it's giving them educational toys and, and tools so that kids are coming to us more prepared. Our second goal is around maximizing instructional time. We want every student to participate in at least 95% of the instructional days in the year. And we're working on this two different ways. Um, one is that we are um, working on reducing our number of suspensions. You've heard a lot of, uh, about that over time. Uh, we have in the past invested in positive behavior interventions and support, which is a training program to teach kind of school-wide expectations and rules, but we've also invested an additional $250,000 this year into more supports for teachers in coaching, classroom management training, um, getting them support with kids that, they, that are acting out that they're just not sure what to do with. Um, so we're hoping that this reduces our number of suspensions that we have. We also um, have partnered with the city police department, and they, they work with us to help us, for kids who are chronically truant, to help us contact families, talk about the importance of schools, schools so we can get them back to school and make sure that they are taking full advantage of the opportunities that we have for them. Um, the next one uh, is student engagement and voice. We want every student to play a personal and meaningful role in their own learning and in the educational decisions for their school, district, and community. And we're doing this in a variety of ways. Um, one is we do have um, different advisory committees, including a student advisory committee that um, I'm going to be starting, where they can work to give me input on a variety of topics over the course of the year. We are going to have seats for students on our district task forces. Uh, we're even, I'm training my senior leadership team on how to do Twitter chats so we can start to engage with more students and families on social media and be available to answer questions and to get feedback and ask them questions about things. We also are excited that we're trying to connect them with more opportunities to make school meaningful. So um, some of the great arts opportunities that our partners have helped us provide um, are things like El Sistema, which the picture in the top is from there. We've got this really great ballroom dancing program going on in many of our schools, so that middle picture is from there. Um, we've got A+, plus, Oklahoma A+, plus from UCO that's happening in many of our schools. And um, Black Inc. is also supporting us with arts training through the Kennedy Center. We also have lots of athletic opportunities for students, and so Fields and Futures has just been an amazing partner to help us fix up our fields, um, get really, really amazing athletic fields that, that our kids are excited and want to play and practice on. Um, we've got the Police Athletic League, who's helping to get sports into our elementary schools that normally wouldn't have them, so kids have something exciting and positive to do after school, and Cleats for Kids is helping to get us athletic equipment, because during such a tough budget time, we really rely on our partners to help us get things to make sure kids still have a great educational experience in our district. Um, and also field trip opportunities for students. You know, we're trying to give them ways to engage, have fun, learn about their community. And we've got two great things that are happening this year. One is we're going to be sending all of our ninth graders to go see the Oklahoma City National Memorial Museum. Um, and we're also going to be sending our fifth graders to go to see the Oklahoma Contemporary Arts Center, um, thanks to the Kirkpatrick Family Foundation, um, OG&E, and AT&T, who are going to pay for transportation um, for our kids to some of those museums, and the city of Oklahoma City that has actually been talking with us around um, kids being able to ride buses on their field trips for, for free if, if the field trip place happens to be near a bus stop. Mastery of course subjects, every student is, will meet the standards of performance in core subjects at key transition grade levels. So we've got our schools that are setting goals and tracking progress over the next five years for how we're going to improve literacy, math, and science. Some of the things that we're doing, we've got this really great OKC compact group that's made up of the foundation, the city, the Chamber of Commerce, United Way, and we are working on launching a new initiative called Read OKC. Yesterday, that's a picture of me from Wilson Elementary where I was filming a commercial um, with a special celebrity guest that I'm not going to mention, but um, we, we are about to launch a big campaign trying to see how we can get all kids across our city reading more. 
Uh, Mayan Reader is something that we've launched for all of our elementary kids this year. This program is so awesome because it's essentially like Netflix for books. So kids get on there. They do a quick um, reading level assessment and also an in interest inventory. And it, it basically gives kids, when they log on to the system, you know, because you like books about zombies, here's 10 other books about zombies that you are going to love. And, you know, it's everything that kids are really, really interested in. Um, and what's really great is I've been out and seen kids, kids using this. And even for kids who normally don't love to read, this has found ways that they have been able to connect with it, find things that they're excited about. We just purchased it for el every elementary kid in our system where they will have access to 10,000 books online, which can be downloaded from any device, like your mom's phone, or they can use it at the library or McDonald's, um, a home computer. Even if you don't have a computer, um, they're, they, we're, we're piloting ways for them to be able to get access because we just want kids to read more out of school. Um, also, if you have wireless, that's really great because you can just download any books that, that you want to anytime you want. But um, one of the things that we were worried about is our families who don't have access to wireless at their house. And this is where Cox has been really, really wonderful and generous to talk to us about being able to offer wireless to our low-income families for only $10 a month. Um, and so what we're doing is trying to tell people about these opportunities because we want to make sure every kid in our city has access to whatever books they want so they can read all the time, find things that they love, and we are just so excited about this moving forward. Uh, we are also implementing new academic standards. Um, our state adopted some new standards, which we love because they're more rigorous than the standards from before. So we've been really busy training our teachers in how to implement them and also just providing more teacher support. We're, we're implementing a, a teacher instructional coach model where there's a coach at every single school. Um, and this is especially important for new teachers in our system because before they didn't necessarily get as much support as they needed. Uh, we only had 11 schools that had a new teacher support um, coach. And so if you were a new teacher at a different school, you might not have gotten a lot of coaching. This year, we've found a different way to fund this model where we can have a coach at every school so that every new teacher is going to get the support they need. We're also um, working on accelerating performance for underperforming groups. We have um, some low-performing student groups that we want to perform at a level that closes the opportunity, learning, and achievement gaps. And one of the things that we're doing right now is we've just um, put a call to action for anyone who wants to join our Northeast Task Force. And this is a group that will, over the course of September through December, look at high-performing, high-poverty schools from across the country, do some site visits, make a set of recommendations about what we think it'll take to improve our schools in Northeast Oklahoma City um, in terms of school structure and options, academic supports, and wraparound service and supports. What's so exciting to me is we announced that we are taking applications for this committee last Saturday. Um, by Monday morning, we had had 106 people sign up to be on this committee, only 20 spots, um, and the number is just continuing to grow. This shows me that people in this city are so committed and want to be part of the solution and want to be part of the change in transforming public education for our kids in this city. We also... Um, are working on making sure more kids are having access to higher level courses of study outside the core subjects and even in the core subjects. Um, we, one thing is we've joined with COSTEMA, which is the Central Oklahoma STEM Alliance. And this is a partnership of STEM groups from across the Oklahoma City metro area that are working together to figure out how do we get kids access um, and opportunities in more STEM fields to make sure that we're preparing more graduates to go on and be able to take jobs in our, in our city. Um, one of my big things that makes me so angry or frustrated about our city is that we don't even have um, rigorous advanced STEM offerings at all of our high schools. When I, um, one of the things that I know, I've learned recently that I'm definitely going to change within the next five years is that we don't have physics offered um, at any of our comprehensive high schools right now. And that, to me, 
it should be a basic that every school has. I mean, we should have even, even more science and engineering courses and advanced math, but to not even have the basics is, is pretty shocking. And so over the next five years with COSTEMA, you're going to see us really work to improve those STEM offerings. Um, we also have some really great advanced course offerings through places like OCCC and um, UCO, where kids are able to take college credit, college classes, and earn both high school credit and college credit. Um, when I went to the graduation at Northeast High School, and this is one of our graduates from Northeast, um, she graduated valedictorian, and she actually was graduating with 34 college credits at the same time. This is a really amazing opportunity, and we want to be able to share this with more kids so that even more kids can take advantage of that going into college. Next, um, and our final big area is high school graduation. We want every student to graduate from high school prepared for success in college and career technical fields. And so some of the things that we're doing um, to work on that as we've been um, prepping, putting prep, ACT and SAT prep courses in our schools so that students can be more prepared and when they take those exams, increasing our CTE offerings, that's career and technical education, so that more kids can have access to advanced technical courses in case they're choosing not to go to college but want a really great job in a, in a other type of career field. And we're also um, increasing our investment in AVID, which stands for um, achievement via individual determination. And this is a really great program that puts the supports in place for kids, um, gets some extra tutoring while they're in advanced courses to make sure that they're going to be successful. So you might be wondering, okay, so how do we, where do we come in and how can we help contribute? There are a couple big things that I think all of you can do to help support us. Number one, um, we've got something called Partners in Action, and this is a program where schools are putting their needs that they cannot afford currently onto like little cards and letting you know what they need in terms of tutors and volunteers, donations, um, specific things that they need funded, and every school has got a little list. And so if you have a school that you are really interested in or care about, you should go and find out what is exactly that they need and how can you help them in, in whatever way you're able to contribute. Donors Choose is a very similar type of thing except for teachers. And so um, we did just really cut deeply our school budgets for supplies. And so there are things that our teachers need in their classrooms right now that they just can't afford. And what they do is they go on Donors Choose and put a little project up. And you see a picture of their class and what they need. And you can make a 20, 10 or $25 donation to help them get um, the things that they need for their classroom. And what's been really great is um, we've had some really wonderful sponsors who've stepped up and agreed to match the funds that anyone else will donate to Donors Choose. Sonic made a huge, huge donation. Love's Travel Stop made a huge donation in matching funds. So that means your money, when you go on to donate, will be doubled to help that teacher get to their goal faster. We're also trying to raise money right now for Code a Kid, which may, will make sure that every student will um, have a coat and a pair of gloves and a hat this winter. Um, it's an unfortunate reality in our district that not every child has access to a coat that fits them. And so we want to make sure that before the weather gets cold, that this is not a problem for any of our students. And so we're taking donations if you can afford to help us buy some extra coats. And then long term, um, I would just encourage everyone to register to vote, to be to educate yourself about um, any education-related things that are coming onto the ballots, um, and, and to figure out how are we long-term going to make changes to education funding in our state, because we cannot continue to be on a roller coaster where education funding is simply tied to oil and gas, and where every few years the bottom falls out and we're having to slash our budgets. Our kids deserve stable funding, and so do our teachers. And so, thank you. So I just quickly want to show a couple pictures. Um, this is a great picture from Donors Choose. Uh, basically, when the teachers put their projects, and once it finally gets funded, they come to the school, and it comes in a box. And so we had a great um, press conference with uh, Love's Travel Stop, who had made their donation. And this is a teacher who is actually getting her box, and the kids are there while she's opening it to see what they got for their classroom. Um, 
Here's a, a picture of like the kind of things that we've got on Partners in Action. Um, we had a little event on the south side in the Capitol Hill area where we had the Capitol Hill schools come up and, and they put what they need on these little cards and people can come sign up. And some of the needs are things like tutors or volunteers or some money for some safety goggles for um, science equipment. This is a, one of the big ones that I've seen, but it's they're trying to get a mariachi program at Scheidler. And so they're asking for any donations that people can, can donate. And so these are just really great ways for people to be able to help like, local neighborhood schools. And finally, I just want to close with a quote. Um, from one of our high school graduates from last year. This is Nate Bullock, who graduated from Northwest Class in High School. And he talked in his graduation speech about overcoming obstacles to reach your goals. And what he said, and I think this really resonated with me because this is how I feel as the leader of this school district, it's that we are not underdogs, we are overcomers. So we may have the odds stacked against us right now in Oklahoma City, um, but we're up for this challenge, and we are determined to succeed. And we are going to overcome these tough times. We're going to emerge from this budget crisis smarter and more resourceful. And five years from now, this is going to be the district that this whole nation is watching. Um, and with your support, we are going to make the impossible happen for the children of Oklahoma City. There is no doubt in my mind this is going to happen. So I just want to thank you for being here. Thank you for allowing me to be the new leader of Oklahoma City Public Schools. Um, thank you to your commitment to support of our district. And most of all, thank you for your commitment and love and caring and support for the children of Oklahoma City. Thank you. For the school board members in the room, um, please go back and tell your peers, thank you, thank you, thank you. I think there is not a person in this room that has a question that you hired exactly the right person for this critical job at this point in time. So thank you so much for what you're doing. And she's leaving. She's not even going to stay for lunch. She's got work to do. <laughs> um, please enjoy your lunch. Um, we will be back with you in just a few moments. Thank you. Um, I know that most of you are still eating and you're probably enjoying the conversation at your table, but we would like to resume our program to try to be sensitive to your time and get you out as quickly as possible um, to our closing time. Um, so uh, Superintendent Laura talked a little bit about the compact and the work that uh, the compact is doing with Oklahoma City Public Schools related to their, li their literacy initiative. The role that the Chamber and the Compact Partners are taking is really about helping the district promote from a PR and marketing standpoint um, and elevating literacy as a community priority, even a family priority. The entire literacy conversation is really a family conversation in our city. So the district is focusing primarily on Myon as the tool that they will be deploying with their students, but it also is a resource that families can use. And so how the chamber and the other compact members will be supporting that effort is by making that um, tool um, something that families, something that other people in, um, in every household might look to to download books to have access to other kinds of opportunities, perhaps to even increase their own literacy. In the communities that Mayon has um, already been deployed, what those communities have found is that once the adults in the household start seeing how students use that tool, they begin using it to increase their entire literacy. So the compact really has a desire to improve literacy throughout our community using our school district as our primary model. So look for more about that, because we're really looking to make that a primary initiative of education and community improvement move, moving forward. In addition, um, the chamber is also working on 
public education policy. And we're working closely with the State Department of Education, which I know we've got some members here today, which we very much appreciate your attendance, working with them and with the legislative body to establish higher test standards, looking for standardized ways that we can tell the rest of the nation and the rest of the world how outstanding our students are, a way for them to be able to benchmark themselves um, against the skill sets that are needed to be successful in this culture. We talk a lot in the chamber about workforce development and having a skilled workforce. We also have the obligation of making sure that our students are ready for a global workforce. We want to keep them here, working real hard on keeping them here, but we want them to be able to be competitive anywhere they choose to go and where their lives take them. Um, so at this time, we would like to, I would like to introduce um, Bob Ross, President and CEO of In As Much Foundation to the stage, and he will introduce our next speaker. Please welcome Bob Ross. Thank you, Teresa. It's great to be here, and uh, thanks to all of you for coming out today to support public education in Oklahoma City. Uh, thanks, a big thanks to the uh, Greater Oklahoma City Chamber for hosting this annual event. The Chamber is a true advocate for our children, uh, birth through college, their families, and all the teachers uh, helping them along the way. And I would like to personally uh, commend the Chamber for the focus of today's keynote speech emphasizing early care and education for children birth through five years old. I'd also like to say how encouraged I am by our newest uh, Oklahoma City Public Schools Superintendent, Aurora Laura. Uh, in her very first school board meeting, she showed the ability to reach compromise between groups uh, who all want the best for our children. I'm so excited about the direction she will take uh, for our largest urban school district. Aurora, it's great to have you in Oklahoma City. The challenges facing Oklahoma City Public Schools, as we've already heard today, are real and daunting, but there are things all of us in this room can do to help prepare our children uh, before they reach kindergarten, and that is what our keynote speaker, Jim Sperlino, will address. Before I introduce Jim, I wanted to take this opportunity to, to set the stage a little of what early childhood education currently looks like for the over 65,000 children birth to five years old in Oklahoma County. Over 41,000 of these children have working parents and require childcare. The first five years fund conducted a survey in May illustrating that while we may have a divided electorate in America today, the country is united on the need for early childhood education. As many of us in this room know from raising our own children, the challenge of finding early care and education that is affordable and covers regular work hours can be a battle requiring piecing together a schedule that includes daycare relatives and friends. Now imagine the task while being in poverty with limited income, unreliable transportation, and a volatile work schedule. And suddenly that challenge is a daily struggle. If not for DHS subsidies, families may spend 20 to 40% of their monthly income on childcare alone and often resort to low cost, poorly rated, one star family childcare, ch childcare homes as their only option. DHS subsidy is a critical piece of the puzzle when serving vulnerable families, as 96% of children on subsidy attend higher rated two and three star facilities. We must thank Director of Oklahoma Department of Human Services, Ed Lake, for helping to lift the recent subsidy freeze on this. Many organizations support early childhood education in Oklahoma City. Oklahoma Champions for Early Opportunities, OKCEO is what it's called, is a statewide network for over 60 business and community leaders dedicated to advocating to Oklahoma's business, community, and legislative leaders about the strong link between early childhood development and economic growth. The network was formed in late 2010 and is sponsored by the Oklahoma Business Roundtable, Smart Start Oklahoma, and the Potts Family Foundation. Many OK CEOs are in this room today, and I applaud you for all your efforts. Please keep up all the great work. Operated by Sunbeam Family Services, Oklahoma City Educare, as Aurora had mentioned, uh, serves 200 children birth uh, to five with the highest quality early care and education and wraparound 
intensive interventions to support each child's family. Educare is a wonderful national network of schools that is actually conducting the largest and most comprehensive long-term evaluation of the effects of a quality early education on children throughout their lives since the Perry uh, Preschool Project began in 1962. It will be interesting to see how these results do. Sunbeam Family Services additionally was awarded a very competitive Early Head Start Child Care Partnership Grant by the federal government in 2015 that allows them to serve in a, uh, 312 children ages birth through three and their families with the help of child care partners throughout the metro area. Jim Priest has led Sunbeam Family Services in, uh, since 2014 and is also working diligently on behalf of Early Childhood Education as the chair of OKCEO's advisory board. Community Action Agency, led by Jim Sconzo, oversees the care and education of over 2,000 three and four year old children through a federal Head Start grant by partnering with Oklahoma City Public Schools to offer the care in public school sites. With the encouragement and support of many, including grants from Inasmuch Foundation totaling $1.7 million, Oklahoma City Public Schools is close to reaching their goal of 100% of four year olds having access to voluntary pre kindergarten classes at their neighborhood elementary schools. 100% all-day pre-K and K is critical to our community as it prepares children for success in school with the goal of reading at grade level by third grade. As John Rex had always told me, you learn to read by grade three, and after third grade, you read to learn. Our children must read by third grade, period. Rainbow Fleet, led by Carrie Williams, serves parents and community members in Oklahoma County for child care resource and referral. While Rainbow Fleet offers a variety of valuable services, their most utilized service is assisting families in locating quality child care in a zip code specific to their home or workplace. Smart Start Oklahoma serves as Oklahoma's statewide early childhood initiative and advisory council. Led by Deborah Anderson, Smart Start seeks to provide better opportunities for children while coordinating an early childhood system focused on strengthening families and school readiness. Originally incubated at United Way of Central Oklahoma, Smart Start Central Oklahoma is the boots on the ground in Oklahoma City. Led by Stacy Dykstra, Smart Start Central Oklahoma's signature program is called Early Birds that Aurora had mentioned. And it works in collaboration with the public schools to train parents how to prepare their children emotionally, social, socially, and academically for kindergarten. United Way's annual publication of Vital Science and Data Center, as well as Smart Start Central Oklahoma's website, are excellent resources for those wanting to learn more about early education in Central Oklahoma. So today I've only provided a small snapshot of services available in Oklahoma City for families raising children ages birth to five. As you can see, it takes a highly coordinated effort by many to make progress taking care of our youngest and most vulnerable children. I want to thank the countless philanthropic partners and business leaders in this room who are already supporting many of these efforts. We can take pride in the strength of the collaborative approach Oklahoma City takes when caring for our youngest citizens. However, there is still much more work to do. Recently, Inasmuch Foundation joined with a public-private partnership formed to explore pay-for-success opportunities in the early childhood arena. I must recognize Aurora again, um, Oklahoma Commissioner of Health Terry Klein, Oklahoma Healthcare Authority CEO Nico Gomez, Kirkpatrick Family Fund, Potts Family Foundation, and Smart Start Oklahoma for their leadership in this effort. Innovative ideas like pay for success models are crucial to explore in the current economic climate. Research and the success of the programs I've mentioned in Oklahoma City point to proven strategies that can assist working parents in gaining greater financial security and providing a better foundation for the future of their families and the future of our city. So now that you've heard a little bit about the state of early childhood education in Oklahoma, I'd like to introduce you to today's keynote speaker, Jim Sperino who will share more about the national early childhood education landscape and what businesses can do to support the families of their employees. Jim is the president and owner of Sperlino Materials, a construction materials company with concrete plants in Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana. Sperlino Materials supplied concrete for the Indianapolis Colts New Stadium, as well as Bristol Motor Speedway. While hearing about these projects would certainly be fascinating, today we are asking Jim to share his other expertise with us, early childhood education. With over a decade of experience advocating and promoting early childhood education, Jim currently serves as chairman of the board of trustees of Every Child Succeeds, a Cincinnati-based home visitation program serving first-time at-risk mothers in the greater Cincinnati area. 
Every Child Succeeds is nationally recognized and a leader in providing innovative and evidence-based interventions to the most vulnerable families. Jim also served on the Board of Trustees of Home Instruction for Parents of Preschool Youngsters, a national program for home, for home visitation to educate parents to be their child's first teacher, preparing them for kindergarten. He's an active funder and supporter of Ohio United Way, a longtime member of the Tocqueville Society, and signed the Ready Nation Pledge, joining hundreds of business leaders and organizations nationally, indicating their belief in the importance of quality early childhood development programs. Please join me in giving a, a, well, war, war, welcome, a warm welcome to Jim Sperlino. Can everybody hear me all right? Great, thank you for having me. I, I, I've really enjoyed uh, coming and seeing your city and hearing uh, what you all are doing. It sounds very exciting, the 25 by 25 effort along with the OK CEOs, I think is really the right place for the right time uh, to get engaged. Um, I do want to clarify, I, I am a businessman from Ohio in the concrete industry, and I am in the right place. <laughs> I realize that that's not necessarily who you might expect to hear, and, and, uh, and I, I think the best way for me to tell you about, about how I came to early childhood as being such an important part of this continuum that does include K through 12, but is such an important part of the continuum is just to tell you how I got here, tell you how I got to that point. And like a lot of businessmen uh, and a lot of community leaders, over the years you get asked to join boards, you get asked to join groups and task force to study things and, and do recommendations. And I can recall several years ago being asked to join a task force that would meet for a certain amount of time and study workforce development and offer some recommendations to the uh, local city and county uh, leadership. And I remember I joined with a group of like businessmen, and, and at least in the first meeting, we sat and we commiserated and complained. We can't find qualified applicants. It's hard to find people, whether unemployment's at 10% or 5%. It's just hard to find good applicants. And why is that? And so we started like a lot of folks, and we really started to gather data to try and understand the subject. And we started to gather data that we found was really nationwide even similar to what we were finding in our own local city there in Cincinnati and Dayton, Ohio. We found things like our national reading, science, and math skills may not be what, what we'd like them to be. And we know that, for instance, from uh, PISA scores, PISA, that are done every three years. They test 15-year-olds across the world, 65 countries, 28 million children in 2013 was the last test. And then they rank them. And maybe some of you have seen those rankings. But the United States ranks 17th to 27th in reading, science, and math. 27th in math. That's not very good. That's not something that's making us competitive economically. In this same group, we had a, uh, a general from the Air Force because we have a large facility, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in southwest Ohio. It's the, actually the largest single site employer in the state of Ohio, 26,000 people in one base every day. And he was there, and he, he brought to us what maybe many of you have seen as well is a Department of Defense study that was done. And it showed that 71% of our 17 to 24-year-olds are ineligible for service. And he's, he looked at us the same way we were looking at ourselves, saying, how can this be? How can this happen to the greatest country in the world? And then we looked at one other study. We looked at a study that had come out recently from Georgetown University that showed that by 2020, 65% of job openings are going to require some sort of post-secondary education training certification. So we got to that point, and we, th we really looked at each other and said, let's, let's try and figure this out a little more, because that's what we need. Most of us, as those, uh, the employers in that room, needed a high school graduate with a little bit of training or a certification, 
maybe a two-year degree, not often a four-year degree. That was the vast majority of what we were, we were in need of, what we didn't have and couldn't find. So we went about looking at it like any normal uh, businessman would do. And um, in particular, I, I turned to the group and I said, well, let's, let's call on Toyota. So now I know you're thinking, Ohio, businessman, concrete, now Toyota. <laughs> Where is this going? There is a book called The Toyota Way by Jeffrey Liker. And it is kind of a, uh, a Bible in manufacturing. Toyota for years had been the gold standard in automotive manufacturing and indeed in, in many types of manufacturing. But the interesting thing I took away from that book that I like to use often is there's a concept in Toyota manufacturing philosophy that says you have to ask the question why five times before you get to the root cause of the issue and you're able to do an analysis that can resolve it. Five times. So we took this group, this workforce development group, we said we need high school graduates. What kind of graduation rate do we have? And I'm just curious, Superintendent Laura, I hate your drinking and I hate to call on you, but what's, what's the graduation rate here? 73%, so you're a little below national average. National average is 80%, roughly. But think of that. 27% of your high school students aren't graduating. And by the way, if they, if they don't graduate and you say, well, they got a GED, guess what? The research shows that a GED's economic potential in his lifetime is the same as a dropout. We have to get them to graduate from high school. So, Toyota, five whys. Why aren't we getting high school graduates? First why. What we do know is high school gradu graduation rates are closely correlated to ninth and 10th grade achievement tests. Sometimes they're called graduation tests. Sometimes they're a little combination of both. Why aren't we doing so well there at that ninth and 10th, 10th grade level? Second why. Those test scores are highly correlated to eighth grade math scores. Math, eighth grade math scores where, and I'm assuming, I think I remember, look, actually looked at Oklahoma state statistics, but about the same as national average where approximately two-thirds of, of the eighth graders in Oklahoma and across the country are actually proficient at eighth grade math in that test, two-thirds. Why aren't we doing so good at eighth grade? What's really interesting is the highest correlation to eighth grade math is third grade reading. And as Bob pointed out, is that critical transition where you go from learning to read to reading to learn. And if we can't get to third grade and get them proficient in reading, we've got lots of uphill battles to, uh, ahead of us. And not only are we going to start having students not able to pass these tests or graduate from high school. But even the efforts we have to, to undertake to get them close, or maybe even to get them to graduate, are much more expensive. Special education is one of the biggest expenses that any school system has that's outside of the normal core work that they do. Am I at the fourth why? Why? Why is third grade reading scores so poor? And by the way, it's about the same as eighth grade math. It's about two thirds are proficient. Kindergarten readiness, directly correlated. Kids are not showing up to kindergarten ready to learn. And to make it easy, the fifth why, why aren't they showing up ready to learn? It's because we're not providing that foundation from zero to five that allows them to be ready to learn, that allows them to have the foundation be successful in a K through 12 system that's ready for them. We're just not giving them the raw material in their factory to produce the product that we would all like to have. So having seen this, I went a little further. I'm a businessman and I'm saying, well, I, you know, I need to know more about this. I need, I need to know the science and frankly, I need to know the money. So I went to the science part of it first book I was given on it, and by far the best book I've ever written on brain development, is a book called Inside the Brain 
by Ron Kodalak. I wish you all would read it. Uh, Ron Kodalak is a uh, Pulitzer Prize uh, award winner from Chicago Trib. He's written columns, and he wrote this book called Inside the Brain. It's about brain development in the early years of a child. And it's very readable. I read it. Uh, it. It didn't have any problem understanding it. A concrete guy. But it's, it's fascinating because it talks about the science of brain development that starts occurring even prenatally, where the vast majority of a baby's energy that they consume the food and the energy they're producing goes into brain development where the brain is literally billions of neurons that are forming synapses, that form connections, and they form them at an astounding rate. 700 to 1,000 synapses are formed every second in a baby's brain. And what happens is it's just like, just like a tree. It starts forming these synapses, and it starts growing. All these connections are made, but then an amazing thing happens which is a, much about what human adaptation is, is there's a process called pruning that goes on. It's just like it sounds. And your brain, the brain will start pruning areas that it doesn't need or it's not using or it's not being stimulated. So if a child is not learning letters and words, the brain is going to naturally start pruning that area. And yes, you can get it back later in life. It's much harder, it's much more expensive, and you probably can't get it all the way back. But the brain science is clear. 80 to 90 percent of brain development occurs in those first five years of life. We sp you spend, what do, I'm sorry, superintendent. <laughs> what do you spend a year in K through 12 per child? Is it 10, 12? Thousand dollars? Seven? Oh gosh! I'm gonna send send my Ohio kids down here. We we spend about twelve in Ohio. We spend seven here. Just to give you an idea, I'm, uh, the organization that Bob told you that uh, I've been on the board for a long time spends about three thousand dollars a year per child on home visitation, zero to three. We're spending maybe ten, twelve, seven here per year in K through 12, you're spending probably $25,000 a year in incarceration per prisoner. Pretty cheap. But what's also interesting, as we looked at that brain development information, was we also looked at a couple, just I want to give you a couple other folks that I think are really important to look at. Num number one uh, is Dr. Jack Shankoff from Harvard who runs the Center for the Developing Child, uh, has done fascinating work on brain research and child development. And number two is Dr. Neil Halfon from the UCLA. And Dr. Halfon's done absolutely uh, groundbreaking work, particularly to show that as children start to develop, do brain development, and go through those early, early years of life, that they are put on a trajectory that they are not likely to be able to get off. And so what it says is if you've got a normal child that does this, you've got a child with developmental delays down here, a high-performing child up here, is that those lines start to diverge more and more in those early years. And by the time you get to kindergarten, those divergences are very hard to jump, it's very hard to get those kids back up to another trajectory. So that was the science part. So we, then I had, to, I had to go to the money because I'm a businessman. I had to say, well, what, what are we spending money on? How do we, what's the return? That's just the way I think. And I found amazing work done by a guy named Art Rolnick. I don't know if any of you have heard of Art, but Art worked at the Federal Reserve Board for years and years back in the 90s. He's an economist. His uh, specialization was on pre-Civil War banking. Yeah, I know. And, um, and Art's really funny about it, but he, he really was a well-respected economist within the Federal Reserve Board. And the Federal Reserve president up in Minneapolis went to Art back in the, in the uh, mid-90s and said, Art, I want you to do an economic analysis on return of early childhood using uh, Perry Preschool. And some of you have heard of Perry Preschool. Perry Preschool took 120 kids, 
split them into a randomized control trial. So you split them in half. So one half, it's just like a drug control trial. One half gets the intervention and the other half gets some sort of placebo. And they, followed, they gave it for two years to the, these half the kids. And then they followed them. And they actually followed them forever. They've, they've, these, these kids are now in their 50s and they're following them. And what they found was interesting is they, they actually found at third grade a little bit of fade, which a lot of people in early childhood worry about. You put them in an intervention and then they're done with the intervention and if you don't have some continuum there, if you don't have some support, there's often a risk of fade. And then you wonder, did I waste my money? Well, they found this fade at third grade and they said, that's disappointing, but you know it's not uncommon, let's keep following them. But what they found later then is a whole bunch of benefits. They found that these kids had less special education, less grade repeating. As they got older, they had uh, less incidence of crime, 50% less, by the way. They had less use of welfare. They had better jobs. And when Art did all this number crunching, he got an internal rate of return. That's the percent you get on your investment every year, year after year, just like you put it in a bank in a savings account. He got a return of 18% annually, 18%. And Art will tell you today that is the single largest public policy economic return he has ever seen, ever been documented, 18%. During that same period of time, the stock market averaged 5.8%. And Art, like any rigorous science, scientific person would do, said, I need this peer-reviewed. I'm not even sure I believe it. He sent it to a guy named Dr. James Heckman at the University of Chicago, a Nobel Prize award-winning economist that has done a lot of early childhood study now, all, econ all in economics. And Heckman called him back after a couple months, Art says, and said, Art, I got the same number. It's 18%. By the way, we broke it down a little further. 14 of the 18% were benefits that inured to the public, 4% to the person itself, to the child. The public's getting all that benefit. So these are, those are the science and the money. And then I wanted to see, really, I, I needed to see a program. I needed to understand what was going on. And that's when I joined the board of Every Child Succeeds. It's a, it is a program that serves at-risk moms, most of them first time, um, and their children zero to three, so it serves two generations. And they, do, they actually run four different nationally recognized models, so they're model neutral. And they've been in business for 16 years, and they're seeing, so they're seeing three, over 3,000 kids every year right now. And the results they're getting are just unbelievable. So the, these mothers mostly enroll prenatally. The children in every child succeeds. Been in, been in business 16 years now. Have an infant mortality rate of 4.7. That's well below the state of Ohio, the United States, but in the middle of Cincinnati, Cincinnati has an awful infant mortality rate. It's, about, it's running about nine and a half. So they take the most challenged, the worst of the worst condition, bring those moms in. Those moms' infant mortality rate is cut in half from the general population. Gestational age is appropriate. Birth weight is appropriate. Developmental uh, tests along the way are appropriate. And then the most interesting thing we know is that if you go through three years of Every Child Succeeds and then we connect you via a, uh, via a scholarship program, we call it. We put you in a quality preschool. That's, we got different star ratings than you all have, but it's the same kind of thing. Make sure it's a quality preschool. Those kids score the same on their preschool uh, readiness tests as, as the kids in the outlying school system. So frankly, the school system where my kids go to, where, where all of the more privileged kids go to, the worst of the worst, the hardest challenges in life that these mothers are faced, they get into a good, pre a good zero to three program, get into a quality preschool, 
they're at the same place as my kids, as your kids. That's amazing. So, this all brings me back to concrete. I know you all wanted to go there again. So this is a beautiful building, and uh, I'm, I'm sure we're all glad that there's good, solid concrete on this floor. And when I came into the city last night, um, uh, I saw your somewhat still new skyscraper uh, downtown, 50 stories, I think. And uh, it's a fabulous building. Uh, I mean, it really does look great, and it really stands out. And I am sure the folks at... Is it Devon Energy? Is that right? I'm sure the folks at Devon, and I hope there's a few here. I, I'm sure the folks at Devon Energy on the 50th floor, on the top floor, are very happy that that concrete is really good concrete. It's really solid concrete. Right? So they jump up and down on it. Doesn't break, doesn't crumble. The building doesn't fall down. I am sure that they're, they're very happy that the columns are holding the roof up and they don't get wet. But what's... Interesting to me, the concrete guy is, that's not the most important concrete in that building. Most important concrete in that building isn't on the 50th floor. It's not on the 25th floor. It's not even on the first floor. The most important concrete in that building was poured in the first days and weeks of construction. And it's located tens of feet below the street level. It's the foundation of that building. The reason that building stands, doesn't crumble, doesn't fall over, doesn't fall down, is because of the concrete foundation, tens of feet underneath the street level you don't even see, you don't even think about. That's how I feel about early childhood. Our kids deserve the same foundation. And if we don't give them that strong foundation, we don't give, I'm not going to ask you to answer any questions. If we don't give Superintendent Laura <laughs> that kind of strong foundation to build upon, her efforts are going to be much tougher and the results are going to be much less. And that's why we have to invest early on to help out our children. I appreciate your time. Thanks. Thank you, James. Um, interesting um, perspective and um, very important way to think about the critical nature of early childhood and early gestation. That's something that we're really starting to hear a lot more about. So your perspective is very valued. And thank you to all of our speakers for today. Um, thank you for your passion about public education. Thank you for your passion and dedication to the students of our city. As business leaders, parents, and community members, you all know the importance of education in this community. And I hope that today's conversations and presentations have helped you see ways that you can be of help. Our educators and students need our support at deeper levels more than they have in a very, very long time, if ever. But our community is rallied around education. There's more conversation, more support, and more desire to do something impactful. So as Superintendent Laura talked about, um, there are a couple of opportunities specifically where you can get engaged very directly with education. We love that you would want to support a legislative, um, be supportive on it either in a, as a voter, um, as um, somebody that stands and runs for office supporting education, but even more directly and specifically, um, there's a card in your chair um, and it lines out a couple of the opportunities that Superintendent Laura pointed out. The Partners in Action and the Donors Choose Opportunity. These are programs that are run through the Oklahoma City Public Schools Foundation. And I gotta tell you, um, I, I've done the Donors Choose thing and it is so cool, it is so fun. You read what a teacher talks about, the passion that they have for a particular thing. And I, I got to make the difference in an English classroom reading, I'm a 
literature major, um, reading a, I think it was Tom Sawyer. They only had, I think, like five copies for all of her classes. So for just about $100, I went online, I got to buy those books, the students wrote me notes, the teacher wrote me notes. It really is a great way and a, a very connected way to support education. So take a look at this card. Um, there's also the Partners in Action opportunity for larger organizations or groups. So please, pick your poison. Decide how you want to be engaged, but please engage with and support the students that are working so hard, the teachers that have committed their lives to raising other people's children, and those elected officers that are trying to support our public education system. Thank you very much for being here today, and we stand adjourned.